Nonetheless, it's not all hopeless at this point, right? Congress is actually becoming quite active. Oh. Yay! Here we go. The Senate committee is pushing for health interoperability, right? This was from 2015, right? Interoperability finally takes center stage in Congress. EHR vendor business practices called into question. Lamar Alexander says we will do whatever we need to about electronic health care records that they can't do by executive order, right? And that's a Republican saying he's going to do what Obama can't do by executive order. That's cooperation. It's not hopeless, right? <laughs> Because this is happening. This is becoming the public's view of healthcare. And I can insert the CEO of the month. Right now it happens to be a bank, but you know, we'll go back to healthcare beating up on pharma for a while. This is happening. And so I'm actually leaving this hopeful, right? I'm leaving tonight more hopeful than I've ever been about connected health in the United States for a number of reasons. And I'll sum it up this way. People are making progress in connected health. Great progress around the world. Norway, as I said, has the first 10,000 people signed up. Then they've actually started with social care pilots and moved into medical pilots right now. Denmark has a few thousand COPD patients. And for a country with only 2 million people, right, a few thousand people on a COPD program is pretty good. They've solved some of these infrastructure problems. China, Japan are waking up. Japan woke up after the, uh, the 311 tsunami and realized that the interoperability that they had started to build was a huge boon when lots of people were moved away from the coast and lots of elderly people were put down in a camp and needed access to medications and doctors and blood pressure and hey, we could suddenly drop in a whole bunch of blood pressure meters from A and D and they just kind of worked and they connected to the systems they needed to. So for National Health IT Week, if I could uh, leave you with one message, it would be this. This can be done. There are people scattered throughout the government who understand what needs to happen and who are willing to help us get there. I believe a truly, a truly effective system requires the kind of infrastructure that only governments can build, right? The kind of open, non-blocking internet that the FCC can help to give us. The kind of investment in broadband, right, that only the government can help afford to push out there so that we don't have to be second-class connected health citizens to some of these other nations. And so maybe we can't go down to DC, right, and pick up the pitchforks and the torches and, and head to Congress this year, but there's always next year. <laughs> so if nothing else, I would ask you to, to just keep this in mind, right? Other people are doing it. There are lessons to be learned from their successes. There are allies who want to help us get there. And it's really not that hard. We've built much, much more difficult infrastructure project in the past. So next time, Jeff and his colleagues come around and say, hey, who wants to come down to Washington and help us advocate for something, right? Get on the bus, get on the plane, come on down. Come join us in Washington, D.C. in December. Oh, I silenced alarms and everything. Come join us in Washington, D.C. in December. Um, have these conversations, talk to some of these leaders, and. Uh, and help us push this forward. Because there really is a path, and we can get there. So thank you very much. Great, thanks. Is this on? Um, so thanks very much. We have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Any questions in the room? We have a, a shy lady over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How's the side to get out of her shelf tonight? <laughs> You mentioned Norway, mm -hmm. and what I wanted to ask you was uh, a little bit about um, their involvement in the whole global scene. Through Janice McCallum, who's from Health Content Advisors, who does the most amazing job of keeping me well informed, I learned about the BMJ having a project called Rapid Recommendations that I noticed the group was magic, and most of the people are from Norway, and it's more for patients to have access to guidelines and so on so that they can perhaps make better decisions for themselves. So since you're out there in the global world, what can you tell me about Norway? Why are they so active? What's going on? Money. Oh, money. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think if I have the number right, right, they have, um, their sovereign wealth fund just hit some ridiculous sum, like $10 billion, and they have 5 million citizens, right? So Norway can fund things. They, they like many nations, struck oil, but they invested it wisely. Right? They didn't squander it, and it just continues to grow. 
So Norway can take risks. They've become a benefactor of a large chunk of the world. Um, I think that's driven by a, a social compact. Right? They believe in the power of government. Uh, they argue a lot, just like anybody with their government. But they actually believe at the end of the day, they'll eventually make the right decision. So I think Norway is powerful because they are, they are small, they are committed, they are educated, and they have money. And they're also neutral. Right? They're, a very, they're a relatively neutral country. They're not seen as allied with one political side or another. They tend to be somewhat middle of the road. They're kind of like the Swiss, uh, a northern version of Switzerland. Um, but I also think Norway has some, some powerful and important people in healthcare. Right? Norway has, has some people who know what's going on. And they have a, very, they have a, a surprisingly robust industry. Um, in order to build their national system, for example, they needed to get all of their EHR vendors in line. And that apparently took them about 18 months. Right? And when I asked, how did you do that? Well, they said, well, they're all mostly small Norwegian countries. Right? So Norway and, and Sweden have a structure, a governmental structure, that is not that far off of the United States. Their states and regions are quite powerful. And their central government is respected, but really advises. Right? In both Norway and Sweden, for instance, there is no mandate that they follow the architecture that they adopted. There is merely a recommendation from the central government. And the states and the regions get to decide whether they do that or not. So you know, the, the, the backbone, the health IT backbone in Norway was very regional. And there were some regional players who agreed to work together for the national good. Um, they were enabled by technology. Timing helped them as well in the connected health world anyway. Right? Fire was a big deal. Norway is building their entire movement of data from their national cloud to their regional EHRs on HL7 Fire. We're hosting fire developer days for Connected Health in Amsterdam uh, on the Continua track, and Norway is bringing their connectors to, to try and, and get them in there, along with IBM. So um, I think it's, it's, it's I and mean, I can't discount the money, but I think it's also because they have a sort of tradition of, of thinking that governments can do good things if they just work together, and that seems to work for them. They're funding a lot of other public health work around the world right now. For sure. Thank you. So one question I have is, what, what's the role of unique patient identifiers? <laughs> is that enabling them or not? OK, so unique patient identifier as opposed to a unique device identifier. Yeah. yeah. Um, almost all of these countries have a unique patient identifier. right? There's some form of national health care that gives them something akin to a medical social security number. Could they do it without that? Yes, but then they probably run into the same problem we have, right? Which is, I can collect data from five million people, but I get a million records that I can't really attribute to a, a particular person. So yes, no doubt that a national identifier works. It also helps when you only have five million citizens, right? As opposed to 350 million people to try and identify. So they can do that. Um, if I look to an interesting place that everybody overlooks right now, look at Estonia for a tiny little country, right? They went through a crisis a few years ago with the Russian cyber attacks that more or less shut down a lot of their government systems. So they decided to completely virtualize everything and make sure that it could run outside their borders. So they went for everything from national ID to you know everything backed up and, and cloud-based outside of Estonia if necessary so they could survive another one of those sort of cyber attacks. And they've made great strides in figuring out how to, how to do this kind of national ID thing in a way that's, that's palatable for a people that really don't necessarily like centralized government surveillance. Right? So I think there's some lessons there about how we might, if we want to go that way, might want to, might want to get there. Um, but yeah, it's a big help. Right? It doesn't necessarily help in the collection of data, but it certainly helps in turning it into useful information. Great. We have time for one more question. Yeah, hi, uh, John Moynihan from Extreme Networks. Uh, so a, as an infrastructure provider, we provide infrastructure into hospitals in terms of networking. Um, what we're doing in healthcare is providing intelligent networks that can be used not only as a critical business tool, but also as a critical clinical tool to be able to help drive all these things that you're talking about in terms of protection of medical devices, uh, application, adoption, control and monitoring. What we're finding is is, is when we're when we're having conversations with, with hospitals and health organization is okay, but you know, we have the pipes already, we're good. Mm -hmm. So if you could if you could think of like one 
sort of message that you give them and just basically to say, look, waiting or, or, or staying or being left behind is really not in your best interest. You really need to kind of to understand what is happening and how best you need to move forward and be able to get these analytics at every level of their technology and their organization. Were you, uh, were you at Extreme before the Interacis thing or did you come with Interacis? No, I actually, uh, so I'm the GM of the Healthcare Vertical and I'm um, all two months in. Right. So I was gonna say, if I could solve that problem, I'd still be at Interacis. Um, <laughs> it's a good question, right? I think the, the short answer is one of the things that's pushing connected health into a new direction right now is the cloudification. Okay, that's a new word. Um, the cloudification of services, right? Which is the argument, which is the argument for distributing things out of the data center and doing as much processing as possible at the edge, yep. right? Um, we see that here, right? This is what mobile does, right? Right now, we tend to process a lot at the edge of the network as opposed to shoving everything into one central thing and then running analytics on it. And companies are starting to wake up to that. And then we have an argument to be had, right? Do we just have to keep inventing better and better batteries to do more edge processing? Or are we gonna turn these into the idea of it's a completely dumb terminal and everything is actually gonna go into a, a centralized cloud? But I think where you have the infrastructure argument in hospital, um, right, it's a private cloud argument. And if you can move as much of those analytics out to the edge and onto silicon, as opposed to into the core and running in an application, you will probably get them done faster and be able to triage the larger and larger volumes of data that are coming at people. Um, that is kind of what some of these big national architectures are looking at right now. The reason they built a cloud-based architecture is so that they can do a lot of that pre-processing at the regions as they aggregate, and then really let the regions keep as much of that data and take action on it as fast as possible, only reporting into the sort of central authority as either a backup or for national health schemes or for whatever other reason they need it. But there, you see that processing moving farther and farther to the edge in some cases. Right. And I think that's, a, that's an argument that could be made inside an institution as well, right? That, We're trying. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I look at like sort of a, a, a hospital's infrastructure of a, as a microcosm of what you're talking with the full, full blown connected health. And you know, just like you said, we're moving all the intelligence to the edge of the network as opposed to having to centralize. So all that analytics can happen at every single AP and be native to every single AP as opposed to you know being in the core. There's, um, there's an organization down at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, <coughs> the Chinker People, the Center for Hybrid Multicore Processing something, right? It's an NSF foundation. That's their gig, right? What can we do at supercomputer power built on off-the-shelf processors? Right. And, and they're focusing on problems of national significance right now. So we've been talking to them about some potential connected health kinds of things, right? What can we do to use you know, a data center full of off-the-shelf Dell hardware to do Watson-like processing of, of large volumes of data, either from connected health or otherwise. One thing that I think is gonna drive this in the hospitals is, I often joke that my job, if done right, is to put myself out of business, right? There shouldn't be connected health. I shouldn't be up here talking about connected health. This should just be the way we deliver healthcare. And at some point, the line between what is gathered in acute care settings and what is gathered in, in remote connected health settings should be one thing, and eventually that's gonna converge. And some of the most forward-thinking organizations here in the US have done that, right? Organizations like Kaiser and Partners and others have said, yeah, we're not just gonna take data and shove it into an EMR somewhere. It's gotta go into a centralized platform so there is, if you wanna think of it this way, right? There's one record of patient data whether it's acute care, ambulatory, or remote, it all goes into one place and analytics can be run on a whole big data set. When you start thinking of it that way, that there's only one place for patient data, then starting to push that analysis outside of a core, I think makes sense. So some of the hospitals that are, are moving forward in, I gotta put this informatics degree to use, I've been spending way too much time just, you know, sitting in my office talking about policy stuff. Um, I think there's, a, there's an argument for, for, um, for doing that, right? For, for having a repository but letting the analysis happen where it needs to happen in the architecture. Whether it's at home on a patient's phone, whether it's on some other appliance in between, or whether it's in a hospital pushed out to wherever the data is needed, not pre-processed and then just put onto a terminal. Now the security people might argue with me about that, right? That you're better off keeping it in one place where you can, uh, you can track it, but at least there's an argument to be that. Great, thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you.